Hey, everyone. So glad you're able to join us for another edition of Let's Go Outdoors. Something kind of special today. It was about a year ago that I met our next guest. Uh, Jackie Pollard was at that time a master's student at the University of Alberta, and she was doing a study that I I would dare say uh, probably has never been done before in at least Alberta waters along the eastern slopes, and that is looking at the impact non-native trout have on bull trout. Um, Jackie, I'm 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 not going to take it any further than that because uh, I know you want to get into science, and that's just not my strong point. But uh, thanks so much for doing this, and and I guess um, how long of a study was it? Let's start there. Oh, thanks, Michael. Uh, super happy to be here. It was uh, about two and a half years uh, of a study for my master's, and we did two summers of data collection on the eastern slopes. And just how many streams, how many miles did you end up logging uh, <laughs> uh, doing? I know you used electrofishing an awful lot as one of your, your primary ways to sort of get a, an inventory of different trout. Oh, I don't think I could count the miles that we walked <laughs> up those streams, but we did sample 13 different uh, headwater streams in the eastern slopes there between Rocky Mountain House and Sundry. And okay, so let's jump into it. Um, the, the study was looking at, um, I guess, really the, the impact these non-native trout species have. Uh, what did you find out? Well, we found a number of things here. So we looked at two major aspects of it. We looked at the competition for habitat, and then we also looked at competition for food and uh, food resources that way. So when we're talking about, we'll start with the food section, we found that bull trout were actually displaced from their terrestrial based resources. So these are either flies uh, floating on the surface of the water through drift, or simply from the fish rising and catching um, flying terrestrial invertebrates uh, that when the brook trout and brown trout were present. So they were removed from a resource that they typically use when they're by themselves. However, when these non-native trout were present, they weren't able to use those terrestrial based resources as much. And what kind of impact can you assess um, the damage that having these non-native species have on our on our bull trout populations? Uh, in areas where resources are low, this could be really detrimental to bull trout populations. If there is a lack of resources that they're unable to share, this could come at a reduction to their fitness through reduced ability to eat foods. So this could affect the reproduction their uh their general health so looking at their their weight and their size classes that they reach they may not be able to get enough food to grow to the sizes that they need to reproduce uh and just increase competition for food which uh does not usually end well for a species of course uh, as you probably well know uh bull trout have been migrating further and further up into the colder resources of of our eastern slopes because of whether it's habitat uh, degradation or or other other factors further along the um i guess the prairie creeks and that type of thing um is there any indication that just the sheer number of bull trout living in um higher numbers in, 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 in a smaller amount of stream, that that is having an impact um, on habitat and, and food resources. Oh, 100%. With, with bull trout, because they have such a low thermal tolerance, so they can, can't really hand, handle these high temperatures, they are being pushed further upstream. And we know that is one of the, the major factors contributing to the decline on top of uh, habitat degradation through development and competition from fishes or non-native fishes. So when we add all of these factors together, vultra are just kind of getting hit from all different sides and that really reduces their ability to thrive in the environment. From a, from a predatory perspective, I mean, bull trout are sort of the, uh, the sharks of the freshwater world, uh, especially in a, in, a, in a stream and river, if they can get to the appropriate size. So um, could they look after the problem if, if they do get a chance to get bigger and, and go after um, some of the smaller brook trout and maybe keep a handle on, on population explosions that way? 
you would, I think, need quite a few large bull trout to be doing that. The issue with brook trout is they are so good at reproducing that they often fill streams in much higher densities than the native species that are there. So if bull trout were, say, 50 in this one stream, brook trout could be way higher and just outcompete them in numbers and sheer competition for resources at that point. So it's unlikely that that a uh, bull trout would be able just to outcompete them for resources. Also given that, well, bull trout do get quite big and they can be seen as they sh the sharks. They're a little more lazy with how they eat. They're, they're happy to sit in their nice pool and wait for their food to come to them. And then when you look at these species, when they're interacting, brook trout actually often outcompete the bull trout for resources because they're more aggressive and they're more willing to get out of their their pool habitat and go and search for the food. So certainly here in Alberta, anyways, over the years, we've, we have tried programs where anglers have specifically targeted uh, brook trout to, to try and remove them from uh, streams that are sensitive to bull trout. Um, and that was met, met with, I think, maybe mixed to not great success. I know your study was just to look at the problem, but as you've calculated and, and put together your reports, do you have a, a sense of what can be done, what should be done? Yeah, I think what the benefit that came from this is we can see where bull trout will still thrive. So we know these are going to be streams with cold water, with complex habitats. So they have a variety of pools, riffles, and runs, and and fallen trees in them. So we need to protect those cold, undisturbed, complex streams because those provide the greatest opportunity for bull trout to thrive in and to actually be able to uh, have a competitive advantage in over the non-native trout. And uh, any any sense of where this, you know, uh, this report may end up, uh, Jackie, in terms of, um, as I think I was correct in saying at the top, um, nobody's really done this kind of work before. It, was there interest from from uh, people apart from your professors at the university? Yeah, this has been a, a partial collaboration with um, the government as well, the um Alberta Environments and Parks to do some sampling with us over the summer. So they were interested in con contributing to this and seeing how this will affect bull trout uh, and ties into a big study with DFO looking at uh, the prime habitat for bull trout in Alberta. Um, this can help guide those efforts to identify those core habitats and what needs to be prioritized. Well, you've certainly painted a very interesting picture and, and a, a kind of a cool one to get a better understanding as to not just the, the man-made threats, but the, the natural threats that uh, bull trout face in our, in our streams. And uh, thank you for that work and, and continued success wherever your career may take you. Oh, well, thank you, Michael. It's been great chatting with you today.